Hi there. I'm Nancy Williams, and I am at the Keck Science Department of the Claremont Colleges. So I teach for Scripps College, Pitzer College, and Claremont McKenna College. And I'll be the host for this week's episode of NanoChat Newbies, the Ionic YouTube series about what it's like to teach a foundation level in organic lecture course for the very first time. Uh, I'm joined by our newbies, Wes Farrell and Shirley Lynn, both from the US Naval Academy. So how did the first week of classes go? So I found the first week a little challenging, mostly just due to the fact that we are starting in a virtual environment. Um, thankfully, we'll be back in person next week. Uh, but I always just find it difficult in any class to make connection with students uh, through a screen. So I just wanted to introduce them to inorganic chemistry and get them thinking a little bit about what it is. So I started having them just start off by just having them tell me what they thought inorganic chemistry was. Uh, so I sent them a survey before we met for the first time. And uh, this is an idea I actually got from the Viper website from an LO on there. And not surprisingly, a lot of the responses were just inorganic chemistry is the chemistry of everything except carbon. It's everything that doesn't have to deal with life, uh, answers like that. Uh, and then I went through the journal Inorganic Chemistry, the table of contents online, and just went through some of the titles and abstracts with them and just showed them how inorganic chemistry is kind of a culmination in their coursework of all these different areas of chemistry coming together. So we showed, went through, it touches on PCHEM, catalysis, really you know, applied organic and polymer synthesis, uh, quantum dots, catalysis, all kinds of good stuff. So got them thinking a little bit about just how inorganic chemistry isn't just the fact that there's not carbon there. Um, there's actually lots of carbon. Uh, as an organic metallic chemist myself, I made sure to make that point very clear um, and just show them how it's really gonna, we're gonna touch on a lot of stuff as we move forward. Yeah, I also use the uh, inorganic chemistry table of contents, LO, and I, I adapted that a little bit, but I, I found starting online, as Wes said, just really challenging. Fortunately, I knew four of the students from teaching them as freshmen, which was back, you know, in, in 20, fall of 2019, before the pandemic. So a lot, a lot has happened to this class of, of midshipmen. And I just really wanted to get them, you know, talking to each other and kind of having some fun. So I used a lot of fun questions, like some clicker questions, uh, and then just tried to build some community. So you said that four were repeaters from a previous class. How big is the class in total? I have 19. Okay. I think I have 18. Okay. 16. 16. 16. Sure, <laughs> how many students I have and I don't. <laughs> yeah. So did you do any fun questions, Wes, to kind of get them, you know, relaxed? Yeah, I wanted to have them. I had them uh, defend their position on, you know, really deep philosophical questions like, uh, is cereal a soup? Uh, is Die Hard a Christmas movie, that kind of stuff. And they, I think it's going to be a good semester just based on those responses. Like, like I said, it's really hard through a screen, but some of them started having a little banter back and forth, which I let go for a little bit just because I wanted them to, you know, loosen up a little bit. So I think overall, it's going to be a good semester with this group. Yeah, I find that inorganic chemistry is really the class where um, you really help them to learn to think and talk like chemists. Right. So so getting that robust conversation and discussion um, and that informal way of just let's talk about these ideas is really important at the beginning of the semester. I was also really mindful that I wanted to acknowledge. So, so we started off chapter one, atomic theory. Right. And we're talking about, you know, Bohr and Heisenberg and uh, and Schrodinger. And I actually ended up pulling out um, an LO that, that uh, you reviewed, Nancy, on pre-modern chemistry. This is back in, in summer of 2020. Uh, okay. And, and it, was, it was an LO, it's just a five slides, um, trying to sort of place the fact that, that you know, all these so-called fathers of, of a modern atomic theory, right? They're, they're white males. They all came from Western Europe, right? They were privileged. Uh, people and and just try to talk a little bit about the fact that they used all the knowledge from all the peoples that had done essentially chemistry from the ancient world forward until that time in order to kind of put together these thoughts and ideas about how uh, atoms work and and so the, the the slides just kind of go through like a map of the world and talk about the different contributions from those parts of the world and what was really cool is that after the class was over one of my students just took the time to write me an email. Um, first of all, it was about like some admin stuff, but then later on in the email, they said, you know, I've been at the academy 
X number of semesters now, no instructors ever talked about that issue before and, and quote, it was very cool, unquote, and they appreciated it. So it's like trying something new and getting that kind of feedback. I mean, just from one student even, it's just really rewarding. It, it really is. And I, I shouldn't let this moment go by without pointing out that something that I always have to talk about in this moment is not only was this group of the fathers of modern chemistry, um, all a bunch of, of white men, all in mostly Central Europe, right at the beginning of the 20th centuries, but a lot of them personally were really monsters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've really idolized them and they made fantastic contributions. Um, but it shouldn't go unnoticed that that a lot of them were pretty personally reprehensible people. Um, Heisenberg and, and Schrodinger in particular come in for, for particular appropriate, but uh, yeah. It's a lot to think about. Yeah. Uh, Wes, content wise, how did it go? Um, I think we went a little faster than I would have liked. Um, and I think for me, that just has to do with the fact that when I'm talking to a screen, I'm not getting much feedback. I compensate for that awkwardness by just plowing ahead. Um, so I'm hoping that problem fixes itself as we're in person next week. But, you know, it's, this first chapter is kind of interesting in that we're kind of redoing a lot of things they've already seen. Like they take a year of cleave chemistry, which is a freshman chemistry course, and they've already talked about atomic structure and they've already talked about periodic trends. So it feels in some ways like we're just reteaching this, but like teaching it from a different angle and also a lot more in depth. So you might spend like one or two classes on it when they're freshmen, but now we're spending, you know, weeks on it. Um, I found we can go into a lot more interesting um, things too. So, you know, for instance, we are talking about atomic trends and as you go down the periodic table, atomic radius increases. In Pleve chemistry, sometimes someone will ask me, you know, why in the third row of the transition metals, there's not a big increase there. And I just say there's, a, there's an exception and we'll just move on. But like now we get to actually talk about well, why is that an exception? So I can show them the radial distribution functions of the four F orbitals compared to the same for the five D orbitals. And we see that these four F orbitals are huge, really diffuse, and the five D orbitals really penetrate them pretty significantly. So really getting into the why of why we see these really kind of strange exceptions to what are otherwise pretty, you know, pretty solid trends. So I've been really enjoying it because it feels in some ways like we're reteaching something and that feels a little odd, but in another way, it seems like we're really teaching a whole new course. It really is a rich part of the course for me. I spend a lot of time, I need to make an LO on the, the paper that I think Pico wrote years and years ago on the, the role of spherical nodes in the periodic chemistry of the elements or something like that. Um, but the, the nodal structure of orbitals is something that they really have not thought about and it has all sorts of really interesting implications. Um, and another thing that comes out in this period for me is always talking about the, the four unique parts of the periodic table, that because the first group of S orbitals, the 1S, first group of the P orbitals, the 2P, the first D orbitals, the 3D, and the first Fs, the four Fs, are anomalously small, that this has all kinds of really interesting chemistry. Um, and the chemistry that they've spent all of this time studying is in gen chem and in organic is largely the chemistry of one of these weird parts of the periodic table, the 1S and the 2P part of the periodic table, that really is not a lot like the rest of the periodic table. And that kind of blows yeah. their mind. The first time they see a 3P orbital, they can't believe that it's got this spherical node here because they've been drawing P orbitals on chlorine for a couple of years. It's such a good point because I remember the first time doing chemistry in grad school where you get away from this and it's a little bit mind blowing just thinking like, oh, it's not at all like this thing that we spent years working on. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely so glad that this course is is partnered with quantum chemistry, because as we're moving through this quantum section, I mean, the last time I took quantum it was 1994. That's that's not like a song. I'm saying it, it actually was 1994. So it's been a long time. And I, I'm doing my best to sort of give them what they need for this course and set them up for when they see and use the quantum numbers actually mathematically and in, in, in the um, PCHEM course. Uh, but it's like me learning 
a lot of things that I either have forgotten or never saw. <laughs> so I'm not sure which one of those um, applies, but, uh, but it is really rewarding, especially when the students are asking great questions along the way uh, that really make us, I think, have to think about it. Yeah, this is a, a part of the course where I think you can really teach a lot or you can teach very little. Um, and both are perfectly okay choices. Um, it's, it's not like some other chapters, like the symmetry chapter, where you kind of have to go through all of the symmetry operations and people have to learn how to do those. There's a lot of optional material in here, which is very rich, but also find a skip. Um, and I think your mileage may vary on this, and that's totally fine. I've, I used to teach almost none of this part of the course, and now it's this gigantic part of the course that I don't get out of until it seems like a month into the class, which is probably too long. So what challenges are you, you finding at this, at this stage? What are, you, what are you worried about as you head into this next week? Uh, as we head into the next week, uh, I think it's gonna be a little bit more the same for me just in terms of feeling like I'm teaching something that we've already covered because I'm gonna be getting into Lewis structures. Um, but luckily, Shirley has taken the time to adapt to what was already a really good LO off the Viper website, where we're going to read the original paper from Lewis on Lewis dot structures. So we're going to be talking about Lewis dot structures, but I'm first going to have them read through that original paper and see how he came to these conclusions of these rules for Lewis structures. Um, I think that's really just one of the benefits of this course. In cleave chemistry, we don't have the time uh, and they don't really have the knowledge to go into this kind of depth. Um, but in this case, we really can dig into it a little bit more and we can really have them see how these discoveries or these theories were originally kind of dreamt up. Um, and you know, think about the, there's things at the time that we take for granted now, but they didn't know, like reading that paper, uh, Lewis is debating whether or not there's something between hydrogen and helium. That seems silly to us now, but it's interesting for them to read, I think. So um, it'll be challenging in some ways to get them to think a little bit like that, but it should be a lot of fun. Fantastic. And we're almost out of time, but do you have a last word, Shirley? Just that I'm really excited that we're back in person next week, and I want to get them into groups and working in groups because we, we want to be doing this consistently mm -hmm. throughout the semester. And just we did breakout rooms on, you know, um, on Google Meet. For class and I just want to get them in person working together. That's my goal. Absolutely. Well, thanks for this great conversation and to all of you out in YouTube land who have watched the video. Um, you're invited to continue the conversation about teaching inorganic on the Ionic Discord server, the Viper Pit, and hope to have you all tune in for future episodes. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Wes. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.